Uh, welcome to this MarketLinks webinar on advancing health outcomes and health system performance with digital health solutions, the role and opportunity for governments, the private sector, and development investors. Um, uh, before we begin our event, I just want to remind everyone that you are muted by default. There will be an audience uh, Q&A session towards the end of the event. If you have any questions at any point during the presentation, you can enter them in the Q&A box, which is found in the menu, uh, which is probably at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A. If you click on that, a box will pop up and you can enter your questions there. Um, we'll be capturing your questions throughout the presentation to share them with the speakers to address during the Q&A portion of the event. And so now without further ado, I will turn it over to Nitu Hariharan, the Health Systems Advisor with the Office of Health Systems and the Bureau for Global Health at USAID. Hi everyone, and thank you, Lori, for the introduction and also the rest of the Market Links team who helped us pull this webinar together. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Neetu Hariharan, and I sit in the Office of Health Systems um, at USAID and will be one of your moderators today, and I'll um, get to introduce the rest of the panel and the other moderator at the end. Um, and so before we get started, I also wanted to say a big thank you to all of you joining us today, wherever you are, to discuss discuss um, how leveraging digital solutions within a complex health and market system can advance country health outcomes and system performance. So let's begin. Over the last two decades, the rapid emergence of mobile phone networks across the globe presented an opportunity for improved development outcomes over multiple sectors, from education to agriculture to transportation and everything in between. And for global health, mobile phones and other digital innovations entering the market are showing more potential to tackle many intricate challenges experienced by health systems, including early diagnosis, access to quality care and information, and equitable provision of services among public and private sectors. The technological advancements over the last decade have since found a way to connect health workers to the people they serve, capture accurate health information for decision makers, even in hard to reach areas, and reduce the response time between crises in action with real-time data. We've all witnessed the impact COVID-19 has had on a global level, especially as the pandemic tests the limits of markets around the world, including health. And during the course of the pandemic, several digital technologies have been deployed to address the most urgent needs, including in the immediate outbreak response, but also later in impact mitigation. And while the pandemic has been a big catalyst in the rapid adoption of digital health solutions, there are still system-wide challenges in which this technology can be leveraged to address, such as capitalizing on digital financial solutions to expand access to health insurance and strengthening real-time surveillance data to manage and mitigate risks while ensuring shocks and stresses don't undermine development gains. So it's a pleasure to have this space and opportunity to discuss the potential of leveraging the digital market for health, exploring what facilitates success, and, such as good digital governance, and highlighting examples of digital solutions and actors that are currently in play in advancing the field. So without further ado, um, let me introduce who's with us today to explore this topic further. And if panelists want to turn on their um, cameras, they're more than welcome to. First, I'd like to introduce from USAID, Kelly Saldana, who is our director for the Office of Health Systems in the Global Health Bureau at USAID. Next, we have Adele Wagaman, who is our senior digital health advisor, also from USAID um, and sitting with the Center for Impact and Innovations. And lastly, from USAID, we have Kelly Thomas, who is a technical advisor in the Office of Health Systems, um, also in the Global Health Bureau, and she will be moderating the Q&A portion of after the panel. We're also joined by a couple of people outside of USAID. Um, first, we have Henry Mwanika from PATH, who is their Regional Director of Africa and the Center of Digital and Data Excellence. Um, and then Matthew Gulliford, the founder and CEO of Common Health, an organization that uses digital and mobile technology to advance universal health coverage. Um, so I wanna thank um, the panelists again for joining us today. 
And I think we're all going to actually turn off our um, cameras or if you want to keep them on, please do just for bandwidth issues, since I know um, a few have been experiencing that um, tech issue as of late. So to kick things off, I'd like to actually ask our first question to my colleague, Adele Wagaman. Adele, I think I've quickly touched upon what digital within the health sector refers to, but can you spend a bit more time giving the audience an overview of what we mean when we say digital health? Sure, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. So digital health is a concept that has evolved as the field has evolved over the past 15 or so years uh, that we've been working in and investing in this space. Uh, we started out mostly talking about e-health or electronic health, and then there was this new wave of um, mobile phone growth, and a lot of people started thinking about, well, how do we use mobile phones to reach clients directly and provide health services and health information directly to people with mobile phones. Um, and, and thus off was uh, this new generation of mHealth. And now we're seeing a convergence between eHealth and mHealth through this broader umbrella of digital health, um, by which we essentially are, are referring to any digital tool or system and the data that those tools and systems produce being used to inform um, decision-making at all levels of the health system to strengthen a, strengthen a health system and strengthen a health outcome. Next slide, please. And so this um, includes not only e-health and m-health, but also subdomains like HIS, um, LMIS, uh, as well as newer technologies that increasingly are coming to the fore, such as the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, advanced data analytics, data lakes. Uh, all of these are components of how we are using digital technologies um, to help meet health goals and to help overcome health systems challenges. Uh, and what we're really seeing now, and I think we'll hear this threaded throughout the course of the conversation today, is that uh, we're looking at digital technologies, not for the sake of digital, that should, should never have been the organizing function, uh, but really through the context of a systems level understanding of where are their um, key system bottlenecks that need to be addressed, where are there particular gaps, where um, is data needed to support decision making, and based on that assessment and that wider systems level understanding, um, how can we be mo most strategically engaging with digital technologies and using digital technologies to advance country health systems and to help meet um, country identified health needs. And so that's been a, an important reset that has happened um, throughout the global health sector over the past um, few years. Uh, and you can see that reflected in a new USAID policy document that I'll talk more um, about in just a few moments where USAID is among the 30 plus uh, global health donors to have endorsed the principles of donor alignment for digital health. So this is a recognition of the fact that past approaches to digital health have been challenging because they've introduced a lot of fragmentation um, and uh, it has become difficult to exchange data between all these different uh, digital systems. And so we need a new approach. Um, and this new USAID policy document that I'll, I'll talk more about is how USAID is articulating how it will begin to operationalize these um, digital investment principles or, or principles of donor alignment for digital health uh, that it both co-authored and then endorsed. Um, so this is a field that has grown incredibly rapidly as technology has grown itself incredibly rapidly around the world. Uh, and so we're conscious of looking at um, how we build on the successes of these past investments, but also leverage key insights and key lessons from the space and ensure that we're bearing those in mind in future planning. Thank you, Adele, for that wonderful background. I actually want to turn it over now to Kelly to sort of build on what you said, especially as you highlighted this refocus on the system. Um, so Kelly, can you talk a little bit about how digital health efforts support strengthening health systems and achieving development outcomes? Sure, thank you and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, digital solutions help accelerate health system strengthening efforts when they're done as part of a comprehensive approach. Since about 2007, health system strengthening has been primarily defined by six uh, what are called health systems building blocks. Governance, finance, information, human resources, service delivery, and medical products. Digital solutions have the ability to enhance efforts in each of these areas. 
However, what we've learned is that merely strengthening one of these key functions does not often lead to replicable improvements in health outcomes, which is ultimately the goal of health programs. The same can be said for digitization efforts. Digitization of specific aspects of country health programs may support those individual programs, but does not itself strengthen the overall health system and can create its own challenges in country health systems. Over the past decade, we've seen a proliferation of digital efforts within countries that have led to fragmentation and duplication across programs. Efforts such as the Principles for Digital Development, which was spearheaded by USAID, and USAID's recently released Digital Health Vision provide a framework to address these issues. But from a health systems perspective, success will come with these, when these principles are applied within an overall health system strengthening approach. When we program for health systems, we start with our desired outcomes, whether that is to improve access to health services, the quality of those services, or the efficiency and affordability with which those services are delivered. We look across the system to develop a theory of change towards achieving those outcomes, and then we design programs to address major bottlenecks and take advantage of notable opportunities. As part of that programming process, incorporating digital technologies can enhance our approach. We look for opportunities where these technologies can enhance our efforts, and then we work to implement them in ways that support interoperability and cohesion throughout the system. For example, USAID Indonesia wanted to improve maternal and newborn health outcomes by addressing an issue of frequent health worker shortages in certain areas. USAID Indonesia, through our HRH 2030 project, sought to improve the available information on the health workforce to support recruitment, retention, deployment, and redeployment of workers, thus cutting down on the shortages. The solution was a digital ecosystem that provides real-time quality data for strategic use, while also supporting policy development that addresses the known challenges in the health workforce. These investments in the health workforce and the optimization of information systems proved crucial for supporting health workers during COVID-19. The Indonesian Ministry of Health was able to rapidly develop and deploy data dashboards on the health workforce for decision making during response planning. Additionally, this work was recently recognized by USAID's Digital Development Award Program, known as the DIGIS. Another example is from Mali, where access to care was compromised by shortages of medicines and supplies. In part, these shortages were due to inefficiencies and gaps caused by two separate web-based logistics management systems, OSPSANTE and DH DHIS2, which each aggregated data for different health commodities. Often, users were required to enter the same data into both systems. To decrease the workload at the facility level, USAID helped the Ministry of Health designate DHIS2 as the primary platform for data entry while helping the government make it interoperable so that data entered into DHIS2 automatically transfers to Opsante. This reduced errors and workload for health workers and improved the quality of the data, helping the government determine when more commodities are needed and where. At USAID, we believe that our health system strengthening efforts cut across both government and the private sector. Often, strong health systems are those systems where strong collaboration and connections exist between these sectors. Last fall, USAID awarded the Inclusive Health Access Prize to recognize organizations that have successfully partnered across both public and private sectors to expand access to healthcare. One winner in Nigeria, called MDOC, makes healthcare more available and accessible by providing a mobile and web-based platform that connects people with chronic diseases with personalized integrated care support. Members have access to both virtual and in-person healthcare teams that help them create and achieve their health goals using digital tools, nudges, and in-person meetings. By partnering with three public hospitals, MDOC created a connected ecosystem of integrated care solutions for people with chronic health needs. Not only does this innovation expand access and availability of high quality health services and products, but it also empowers individuals to take charge of their own health needs. MDOC continues to adapt to changes in the health system. In response to COVID-19, MDOC created a directory of testing, treatment, and isolation centers and became an aggregator and transmitter of information about COVID-19, information, preventative measures, and advice. 
So to summarize, digital solutions can be used to increase the performance of health systems and to help countries reach their national health priorities and health outcomes. But success lies in a country's ability to appropriately design and scale not only the digital health solutions, but also the support of policies, regulatory environment, and infrastructure that follow and increase opportunities for financing and sustainable local capacity. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly, for that response. And I want to sort of underscore the last thing that you said. You, you noted several examples of how digital solutions can be used to increase performance of the health system and help countries reach their national health priorities and outcomes. But really, the success of it lies in a country's ability to have the supportive policies, the regulatory environment, and the infrastructure in place and functioning well to allow those technologies and innovations that enter the market to be used effectively and appropriately. Um, so with that sort of line of thinking and thought, I do want to turn it back to Adele to talk a little bit more about how USAID is leveraging or is engaging with governments in partner countries to drive the health sector digital transformation, which includes pushing stronger governance across public and private sectors. Adele? Thanks. Yeah, so um, it is a treat to be able to talk about the USAID Vision for Action in Digital Health or the Digital Health Vision that I referenced earlier. Um, and Kelly mentioned some of these points, but I will um, just briefly talk again about the problem statement um, that the Digital Health Vision is trying to address because it really is so pervasive um, and it's something that we, we need to fix. Uh, in fact, I was um, really, um, kind of taken aback or um, uh, impressed by the number of um, low and middle income country government um, spokespeople who I have heard over the past number of years talk about the challenges of having so many digital systems in their countries and how that in and of itself has become a development challenge. And so we need to be um, very much mindful of from a global health funder perspective, and this is inclusive of USAID, but other global uh, health funders as well, how we are making our investments in these digital systems. And as Kelly said, uh, really being mindful of the broader ecosystem in which these digital tools are used. Um, so specifically, we are looking to overcome the challenge of fragmentation. You can see uh, on the right-hand side, there is a mapping there of a country who mapped their different digital systems with the digital systems organized by color to reflect um, the type of digital system and by size to reflect the scale of digital system. And this gives you a very quick pictorial representation of the kind of um, fragmentation that we're talking about, but also duplication of systems. Uh, and it doesn't take much to understand how that can lead to inefficiencies. On the funder side, from a funding perspective, um, and on the partner country side um, of a, a burden for the health uh, systems managers, for the policy makers, and importantly for the health workers who oftentimes are the ones um, on whom this burden most heavily falls in terms of having to report into multiple digital and data systems um, when that then competes with their ability to provide care. Uh, so we've got a lot of different reasons why we need to be paying really close attention to this, uh, including because this lack of interoperability when you have individual digital systems that have been invested in for single point solutions without a broader systems lens in mind um, frequently means it's really hard to exchange data between these systems. Uh, and that is a big challenge on an ongoing basis for routine health service delivery, but in particular in the context of disease outbreaks like Ebola or like COVID, uh, many other diseases where you need to be able to rapidly exchange data between different digital systems. Next slide, please. So um, here's an example um, from Dr. Sam Cargbo in the Ministry of Health in Sierra Leone talking about how uh, data has been captured in a fragmented manner that impedes decision making or the ability to have an accurate and reliable picture of what exactly is happening. Next slide, please. So there's a, there's a real development imperative to get this right. Um, this is a picture that probably will look familiar to a number of folks on the line of a whiteboard. Um, this is a drawing by uh, Hans Rosling, who many will um, know from his TED Talks, representing the various data systems, digital data systems that were collecting data that were needed to inform the Ebola um, response in West Africa and how difficult it was to try to exchange data between these systems. Next slide, please. 
So like Kelly was saying, we, we really need to, uh, as USAID and as a global health funding community in general, think about digital technologies from a systems lens. Uh, we need to understand the uh, reach and quality of digital connectivity and, and who has access to it. We need to be supporting countries as they strengthen their policy and regulatory environment to ensure that these tools are used in a way that is um, effectively uh, and efficiently meeting their needs. Uh, we need to be building institutional and workforce capacity, this uh, change management that is needed globally um, with donors as well as uh, with partner countries from the USAID perspective to help um, build new skill sets, develop new policies and practices um, and new workflows uh, is, is really critical. And, and that's something that we as USAID are saying we are gonna be putting um, top of mind as we do future planning and, and procurements um, in, the, in the health space as it relates to digital technology. Technologies. Next slide, please. So um, I will close with just mentioning briefly each of the four priorities of the digital health vision. And then if there's time later in questions, I'm, I'm happy to dig in a little bit more. But the digital health vision focuses on four things that we're saying as an initial policy document um, governing the way we make our investments in digital technologies in the health sector. Here are the four things we're going to do to start. Um, and this is a four-year document that likely will be renewed um, uh, in 2024. Um, and so the first is just to make sure that we are assessing where countries are in their health sector digital transformation. This is a complex process, uh, a lot of building blocks like capacity and, and infrastructure policy, regulatory architecture um, that each require their own um, detailed deep dive to understand where countries are in this process so that we A, are leveraging strengths where they exist and B, as funders uh, have a more targeted sense of where we need to be directing our investments in the future to help countries in a strategic and systemic way be advancing their digital transformation. The second priority is national digital health strategies. This is something that we've begun to hear a lot more about um, since the 2018 WHO digital health resolution. Now we have a, a just newly released WHO digital health strategy. Both of these documents um, calling for increased, increased attention to national digital health strategies and where these exist. Oftentimes we have precursor documents like e-health strategies or HIS strategies that can be uh, leveraged and, and built upon. Um, and, and where these documents exist alongside cost of implementation roadmaps, we have for the first time um, a series of budget line items that investors can be thinking about how they direct and align funding to. Um, so that is a, a key planning document um, for countries, but also for their international development partners. The third priority is to strengthen national digital health architectures. I like to think of this as the urban plan um, for digital systems. So how do all these different digital systems come together um, and, and uh, how are they prioritized in such a way to enable interoperability of data so that data can be used to meet um, decision making needs. Um, and then the fourth priority is around leveraging uh, global goods. These can be content global goods or software global goods, um, but we have tremendous investment that has already been directed into the space over the past 15 years, including a, no a number of really robust, mature digital solutions designed um, in particular for a low and middle income country context that have um, become backbones in many places for the way uh, health systems um, and health se sectors are digitizing. Uh, and so we should be considering these tools and uh, leveraging them uh, wherever appropriate. So that's the digital health vision in a nutshell, um, and I'm happy to talk more about it in the Q&A period. Thanks. Thank you, Adele, for that overview. Um, and just for everyone in the audience, if you want to dive deeper, I believe Adele put in the chat um, a link where you can find the digital health vision. It's also on USA.gov, um, and I think it's cross-linked with the Market Links website as well. So um, please take an opportunity to go ahead and open it and browse that. Um, I want, I want to now pass it over to Henry from PATH to actually tell us a little bit more to dive deeper into sort of the role of digital governance, but about the process of establishing good digital governance, but through experiences in, in Tanzania and the East Africa region. Um, so Henry, would you kindly take the floor? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Natalie. So one of the critical ingredients in digital transformation journey and we've seen this in Tanzania as a country, but also East African region uh, as a whole, 
um, is to have a strong leadership, coordination, and governance. And, and we've seen that uh, for you to achieve that, um, you need to have a common vision, um, which means you know, uh, leaders, both policymakers and decision makers and technical individuals within the government needs to share common vision. And that vision needs to be supported by officials at all levels of the health system. Um, so this will uh, help them know when they are successful, what does success look like, but also at the same time, when things don't go according to plan, they know that they're yet to achieve that vision. And we normally say common vision because if you are aligned with the same vision, um, you are likely to support each other in order to achieve that vision. And um, <clears throat> another aspect is uh, making sure that uh, uh, our government officials and counterparts in countries are well informed. They become informed clients. And this can be achieved by exposing them to latest trends in technology, but also attending and bringing together different countries together through webinars uh, for, them, for them to learn from each other. So by making them informed clients, you are likely um, to, to uh, uh, they are likely to provide great leadership and steer, especially to move in the uh, right direction. But also there's a need to have uh, governance structures and policies. Um, this can be in the form of uh, uh, steering committees that sits at national level to make sure that they can have a discussion at policy level, but also technical individuals can come together and provide direction in, in terms of where their countries are moving towards. And this is critical in order to make sure that always if the things go according to plan, there's somebody who can provide feedback. If things don't go according to plan, there's a group or um, a structure that is available to make sure that they can provide uh, that leadership and directives. One of the areas I, I just want to emphasize when it comes to governance structures is we need to make sure that uh, these structures are empowered and uh, also to provide guidance and leadership, but also there are policies in place that can support that digital transformation. Um, another area is uh, just we, we, we need to make sure that the government is always in the driver's seat and uh, because that will increase chances of success in digital transformation journey. Um, as we worked with Tanzania and East African community, we made sure the government or the East African community is leading the process. So even though you provide some technical uh, insights and technical inputs, but the government is always in the driver's seat. They have convening powers, the, uh, they can facilitate all the discussions and partners can come in and provide the needed support, whether it's financial or um, technical um, and facilitate those discussions. But the government has to be seen and uh, uh, run the process. Uh, one area that is also critical is uh, because since um, the digital transformation journey involves everybody. So you need to make sure that all stakeholders are involved. It's not easy, it's difficult because different uh, partners come in with different vision, different experiences, and also different focus. So we need to make sure that the government is empowered to make sure that all stakeholders are involved in order to make sure that there's rich discussions and also um, uh, people can provide the needed inputs. So involvement of stakeholders is also extremely uh, important in order to make sure there's a common vision, coherent plan that is supported by everybody in this. Um, one thing I just want to finish up with, uh, digital transformation is not about, uh, is not a destination and is beyond technology. Uh, digital transformation is about people, is about culture, leadership, and engagement of not only uh, uh, people you work with, but also your consumers, in this case, your clients, because the whole uh, the whole point of having this transformation in the health sector is to improve uh, 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 client experience. So it's, it is about uh, engagement of your customers. In this case, the health sector, they are your clients. So uh, this transformation is 
a is not a destination, it's a journey. And uh, through those critical areas, and we've done this in Tanzania and the East African region, is to make sure that together you can move uh, forward. I'll stop there. If there's any specific questions, I'll be able to react uh, later on. Um, Thanks, Henry, for sharing that experience and, and emphasizing that digital transformation doesn't only occur at the national level, nor is it solely based on changing the market dynamics to allow more technologies to flourish, but it really includes people, it includes understanding the culture, actively engaging and empowering um, so that that common vision that you mentioned is created together and that ultimately leads to successful sort of transformation processes. Um, so thank you for that. Now, um, I think it's time that we maybe try to dig a little bit deeper into a few of the innovations that are taking off in the health sector um, and helping countries advance towards universal health coverage. So I wanna first start off with Kelly um, Saldana, who will speak about leveraging digital financial services. Kelly, can you explain how digitalization and specifically digital financial services advance financial protection and resilience among health users and support health facilities in both public and private sectors? Sure, uh, thank you. First, I wanna note that my points are all covered uh, more comprehensively in this document, the role of digital financial services in advancing USAID's health goals. The document recognizes that financial inclusion is one source of resilience. Resilience being the ability of people, households, communities, countries, and systems to mitigate, adapt to, and recover from shocks and stressors in a manner that reduces chronic vulnerability and facilitates inclusive growth. Financial inclusion is when individuals and businesses have access to useful and affordable financial products and services, such as transactions, payments, remittances, savings, credit, and insurance, which meet their needs and are delivered in a responsible and a sustainable way. So at a big picture level, financial services contribute to resilience by building assets and capacity, not only at the community or individual level, but also at organizational and management levels. And when we say digital financial services, we're referring to financial services that are digitized. This includes not only banking, like savings and loans, but also insurance and payment services like remittances and bill payments. Within health financing, digital financial services can support all, key, all three of the key functions we are concerned with. Those include revenue collection, the pooling of funds from different sources, and payments for services. And those payments can be made by governments uh, to insurance companies or by individuals directly to uh, health facilities. When financial services are digitized, that means that these services can be accessed by digital channels, such as mobile phones, electronic cards, credit, debit, or prepaid cards, uh, electronic vouchers, computers, and other electronic instruments. Often within the health system, one of the biggest challenges is dealing with money at the front line of care. Health workers often need to take time off to travel to urban areas to collect their pay. Districts and facilities have limited means of managing budgets at the local level, and citizens may have difficulty paying for the care that they've received. So digital financial services and health can enable and support governments in transferring funding and pay to frontline institutions and health workers, and they can also support citizens with payment or prepayment for care. In Rwanda, for example, people can pay community-based health insurance premiums using mobile money. As mobile money is already a norm in places like Rwanda, this option is very appealing and convenient to beneficiaries. In Senegal, another of USAID's Inclusive Health Access Prize winners, Joko Sante, is a digital payments platform that ensures money intended for health purposes is not misused by allowing drug prescriptions to be paid for with points instead of cash. It's an app that allows health programs, both public and private, in Senegal to buy points online for their clients. Members of diaspora can also buy points online to send to family or friends. And people can buy points in health facilities or with mobile money that can be used later in quality approved facilities and for quality approved medicines. 
This allows various options for prepayment of health services, thus improving access to care. But digital financial services also enable health governance by providing traceability of funds. Digital financial services systems typically record all transactions, ensuring a high degree of accountability of the funds and enabling improved oversight and transparency. Using data generated by financial services for health can also then be used to improve programming or management to better influence and incentivize health seeking behavior and to understand service utilizations and costs. Much more can also be done with the data. So overall, there's a recognition globally that digital financial services can be used to sustain improvements in health system performance. Digital financial services facilitate financial protection and access to essential services, expands population coverage and supports health service responsiveness. All components of universal health coverage. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And I really appreciated the examples that you included in there, especially because it highlighted people as the center of these innovations and also understanding the, the culture of finances at community levels and how money flows in and out of communities, um, a really important component to that design aspect of these digital solutions. Um, and as Kelly mentioned, a lot of this information has come from this document that was uh, that was created about a year or two ago called The Role of Digital Financial Services in Advancing USAID's Health Goals. You can find that on USAID.gov. And I think that's also cross-linked in the Market Links website. Um, and we can try to post it here on the chat as well. Um, and so now I, last but certainly not least, I wanna pass the final question to Matt, who has been very patiently awaiting. Um, Matt joins us with several years experience in the private health sector, particularly in leveraging mobile phone networks to break down barriers to access and empower individuals to make healthy choices. Um, so Matt, can you speak more about how the potential, what the potential opportunities and benefits are in leveraging digital solutions to one, drive service delivery, especially in underserved communities, um, two, to increase financial protection, and three, actively engage in health education at the community level. Great, thank you so much, Nitu, and it's, it's just such a pleasure to hear uh, the other presenters as well. So thank you all for the opportunity to be with you this evening, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you are. Um, you know, I'll start off, if we go to the next slide, by just sharing a bit about how we view our mission, which again is around using mobile technology to advance universal health coverage. Um, and, you know, we view that as three components. So the first, um, which again is, is sort of well understood, um, is around access to essential health services. So that is a critical part of UHC. The second is providing financial protection um, for families as they interact with the health system. Um, but then there's a third piece that we believe is, is likewise equally important. And that's really looking at how do we identify the main drivers of risk and cost in the system? Um, and that's because we know that uh, LMICs face a $176 billion annual health financing gap, according to the World Bank. Um, and you know, in actual fact, what COVID has really done is to set us further back in closing that gap. So as important as expanding access to services and helping people pay for care in better ways is, we also need to find ways to drive more efficient performance of health systems. And that's where so many of the things that, that Kelly and Henry and Adele spoke about become really important. Um, if we go to the next slide. So how are we doing in uh, many of the markets where we work uh, across LMICs in Asia? And what we see is that, you know, real challenges on each of these dimensions, right? I think, you know, overall um, human resources for health is a, is a well understood challenge in LMICs across the board. That's what you see on the left side. Um, and that we do see very high rates of out-of-pocket spending on health. Uh, and what that does mean is we're, we're not seeing the risk pooling that we need. Um, and we're also not seeing protection against catastrophic expenses. Um, so, you know, that, that's a real challenge for advancing UHC. And at the same time, we see, again, this double burden of non-communicable diseases like diabetes and hypertension um, that are really facing LMICs as they're, again, working out, um, getting universal health coverage working. 
Um, I think, you know, just to one, one piece on that, that middle component, um, you know, it's, it's really exciting to be in a discussion around markets because I think what that, what that middle chart shows is that there are markets for health services in many LMICs um, and that those markets in many places uh, have spending that is dominated by the private sector. That in where we work predominantly Bangladesh and Myanmar, most spending on health is through private sector out-of-pocket payments. And so finding ways to get the private sector to, to perform better and finding solutions for that becomes really critical in advancing UHC. So in the next slide, I'll share a bit about our approach for how we've worked on it on addressing this. Um, so Common Health is really focused on uh, developing and scaling up mobile technology to advance universal health coverage. Um, our you know, heritage is in scaling mobile enabled health microinsurance to 5 million beneficiaries in Bangladesh. Um, again, that's where beneficiaries would use mobile infrastructure to make premium payments, uh, to receive telemedicine services, but also to receive payments of benefits through digital financial services infrastructure. So what we see is that mobile technology has a role to play uh, both in terms of the front end around looking at beneficiary recruitment and premium collection, but also directly in terms of service delivery. And our focus now is on working across four dimensions. So one is around health financing and payments. How do we pay providers and if necessary, pay benefits to patients as well? Um, bundling health financing with access to primary care over the phone, both as a way of expanding access to essential health services and um, playing a role as a gatekeeper and helping ensure that resources are utilized more effectively, driving health information, um, and then delivering this coordination of care um, that becomes so important in, in addressing these main drivers of challenges to financial sustainability for health systems, and that really do rely on this uh, shared architecture and strategy that Adele mentioned. Um, and so we are working across Bangladesh, Myanmar, and increasingly other countries in South and Southeast Asia. Um, and really where we see the opportunity is on pulling together again, public and private sector delivery and financing to start to help families and health systems manage the complexity that is coming um, as we see this changing disease burden. Um, so with that, I'll pause there um, and happy to speak more during the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for also including data. I think it was incredibly helpful to sort of see um, you situate sort of that country example in that context and also highlighting how, um, you know, the, the digital solutions were being adapted to that situation and created to address those needs. Um, so that was extremely uh, helpful. And if you all uh, want to learn more about his organization, the work that they do, please don't hesitate to reach out to Matt directly. I think his um, information is also available on the slide deck. Um, and I think for now, I know we only have about 10 minutes left, so we'll conclude the panel portion of the presentation. And I want to thank the panelists again for joining us today and remind the audience that several of the documents that were mentioned in this webinar can be found on usa.gov and it's also cross-linked with the market links website and um, you have the information of these panelists here so feel free to reach out to them on your own if you have additional questions um, but with the limited time we have remaining i do want to turn it over to you all um, and also over to my colleague kelly thomas who will moderate the q a portion um, so thank you Hi all, I'm just briefly turning on my video to wave. Um, so I think uh, I have a, I've been collecting, well, we've been collecting your uh, questions. I see a quick yes or no question for Matt before we get into the more broad discussion. So Matt, could you quickly um, answer this question of, does this system apply to grants given to local NGOs in in order to monitor the use of the money? So it's a, it's a good question. Um, so what we're, do, what we're doing now actually is, is we have different models, right? So um, obviously there's a market-based model where we're looking at subscriptions that um, individual households may choose to enroll in and pay for themselves. Uh, we are also working with a large multilateral institution in Myanmar right now uh, that is 
that is looking at this issue around third party funders of services, right? And how do we how do we administer that in such a way that we're able to pay for care um, at local clinics and at local healthcare providers, uh, and ensure that that gets to the right place, and that we're also able to monitor uh, really the the outcomes from that and what happens downstream. Um, so I, I would say we're, we're seeing multiple different models. One that is primarily again sort of quote unquote market rate, where households pay their own way for subscriptions. But increasingly, we, we are working with, uh, with third party funders like donors and, and NGOs. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Betty, I'm sure you could reach out to Matt for further information. I'll now ask a question from Sasha about what do the panelists see as the role or obligation of implementing agencies in introducing digital solutions for specific services? recognizing that it's hard enough to do that um, with stakeholders working on malaria, nutrition, HIV, ANC, maybe it may be nearly impossible. Um, I wonder if Henry, you could provide a quick answer first and then maybe we could follow up, um, Adele or Kelly could uh, further elaborate. Henry? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, so that's a, a great question. It is, is always uh, very difficult. So one of the ways you can achieve that is having, um, making sure that you take a systemic view of your digi digital transformation um, journey. So instead of looking at it from a specific disease, uh, it is good to take a holistic systemic view. Um, since we know that uh, the, the same individual may have, may need access to malaria, ANC or HIV interventions. So having a holistic view and look at them as clients instead of a malaria client will help reduce fragmentation. But also there's a need to have a plan on how everything will fit together. And that can be achieved by having architecture in place that provides a way on how different components will fit together and how they can communicate with each other in order to avoid fragmentation. Thank you, Henry. Uh, I don't know if Kelly or Adele has other comments. Just to quickly um, want to double down on everything that Henry said and note that we as a sector are uh, much further along in this space than, they were, than we were even two years ago. So we do now have tools like the Global Digital Health Index that standardize the way we conduct digital health maturity landscapes at the country level and publish those data publicly uh, so that countries and their funding partners can use that data to inform their planning. Um, and we have the uh, Digital Health Atlas, which is a repository of digital systems that are in use in countries so that not only do you understand where a country is in terms of their infrastructure and their architecture and their policy environment, but you also know what tools are already in use in a country that could be adapted and used. And that kind of situational awareness we had been sorely missing. And uh, I think we're, we're making good speed and, and building out uh, that knowledge and understanding and really trying to routinize the use of those kinds of tools. Um, and so it's getting easier. Thanks. Thank you, Adele. Um, I'm going to turn to another question that I think uh, perhaps Kelly might uh, have a comment on uh, from audience member David Hausner. The digital transformation journey makes a lot of sense and mirrors the national development strategies in other areas. How does such a journey get its start? Transformation of digital requires significant financial investment, especially in countries where digital equipment and infrastructure are not yet very advanced. Many of these countries would want to have comprehensive and strategic digital systems, but don't have the funds or don't prioritize their funds for this. How do they get started and what role do donors and implementing partners play to get this going? Sure, um, thanks. And I'll also note um, on the previous question, I think taking a look at the principles for digital development um, provides some guiding thoughts on, you know, if there is a need for a, um, a digital solution that's specific to one program, ways to implement it that allows for future um, integration. And then I think to David's question, from a health system strengthening perspective, we would expect um, 
digitization and national digital development strategies to be part of an overall health system strengthening approach and, and as part of countries national priority setting and vision setting for um, where they want their health system to go. So many countries have um, what they call universal health coverage plans, which are sort of their long term goals and objectives for reaching by 2030, um, a state where, you know, more people have access to services without financial hardship. And so if countries are working down that road towards health system strengthening, they can then start to look where um, are the priorities for integrating a comprehensive digital solution into that. So for example, Ethiopia has done a, a pretty good job of this. They have a, a national 2030 health health systems plan of where they want their health system to be by 2030. And then they've fully incorporated that into their digital transformation plan. So some of that started with just getting um, access to uh, technology, to um, internet and in health facilities and wiring the health facilities. They were able to form public private partnerships to do that. They were then able to take a look at what um, specific um, sources of information and sources of digital were the most important to bring online um, in different parts of the sector. So they're looking um, specifically with respect to supply chain management, how to digitize that. There's a component of um, quality assurance within their drugs and, and pharmaceuticals. And then there's a component related to facility level patient data, which is a little bit slower to come online, but it's all part of a comprehensive strategy and vision. So I don't think countries can sort of achieve digital transformation overnight, but if they're doing so in a way that aligns to their overall health sector plans, as well as sort of their common vision and, and prioritize activities in that way, I think it can be very successful. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Henry and Matt, do you have any uh, follow-up points? Uh, I, I mean, I guess the thing that I would just say on this question about, about vertical programs, it's a really interesting one. Um, you know, from, from our experience working pretty closely with providers and with, and with, with patients, um, you know, pe people don't see vertical programs, right? So, um, you know, patients and families that need medical care don't, don't know where the funding is coming from for that care. They just see problems and are looking for solutions. Um, and I think, you know, as, as Henry said, a lot of the work that can be done to set these, to use vertical programs as a catalyst for broader, health systems changes, that becomes really exciting. But you know, that that's really dependent upon, I would say, the funders of those programs and the implementers of those programs to ex explicitly approach um, how that's done with an eye towards driving broader system change. Um, and, and so, you know, that that's a piece where really the the intention um, on how those programs are implemented matter. And, and, if, and if that intention is there, then they can play a really powerful role. Um, in, in advancing broader universal health coverage and, and digital infrastructure. So that, that's sort of just my, my perspective on that question. Thanks, Matt. Henry, any follow-up points before we move on to the next question? Yeah, the only thing I can add is uh, nowadays, I think it was mentioned by one of the panelists that having in place an investment roadmap that outlines uh, uh, priority areas of investment that the country wants to invest on. And that can be a good tool to have a discussions with donors and investors once you have that. And for you to have a good and informed investment roadmap, you need to do a landscape analysis in order to know where the country is at, to identify the gaps, and then you can come up with uh, priority investments. And once you start investing in those investment areas, uh, priority investments, now you start gaining efficiency and that will bring in more and more um, uh, people uh, to, to get behind that investment plan. Yeah, the digital transformation is expensive, but if you take baby steps, you'll be able to achieve the bigger picture. Thank you, Henry. I see that we are at 11.01. Um, I don't wanna keep you all. I see Adele also added some uh, additional information in the chat. Uh, why don't we turn it back to Nitu to close us out? 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kelly, for that. Um, I just want to thank you all for joining um, this morning for this webinar. And please do not hesitate to reach out to any one of us. I think you can reach out to the Market Links team. There's a few emails that have already been shared with you all. So you can directly reach out to the panelists. But um, we would love to continue the conversation after this. So if you have any additional questions, um, please, please do reach out to us. But thank you all again. And I know it's 11.01. So to not keep anyone any further, um, um, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thank you, Nitu, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, this was a new topic for Market Links, but one that we hope to feature more often in the future. Um, and on that note, um, if you found this topic interesting, please mark your calendars for February 11th at 9 a.m. when Market Links and USAID will present a webinar on health finance and the application of the blended finance roadmap. And uh, finally, I Thank you, a big thank you to everyone who took the time to join us today. Uh, we will be posting a recording of this webinar along with the transcript in a few days. In the meantime, you can find some of the resources that were referenced during this webinar on the Market Links website in the event post about this webinar. Um, again, thanks to our moderators and speakers and for everyone who attended.